Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Hello, you're watching another episode of Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Teresa Griffin Kennedy, and I have two guests right now. Um, we were planning on having Phil Stanford, but unfortunately he didn't show up today, so we will schedule him for another episode. I have J.D. Chandler here today, and I have Bruce Broussard, and I would also like to say to all the mothers out there, Happy Mother's Day. Today is Mother's Day. I would like to wish my mother Doris a Happy Mother's Day, and I'd like to wish Bruce, Bruce Broussard's mother a Happy Mother's Day. And I would like to wish J.D. Chandler's mother a happy Mother's Day. And, um, and my two sisters, Marsha and Bronnie, and my late sister, Margaret, happy Mother's Day. So um, we're going to talk about Rose City Vice, which is Phil Stanford's new book, um, eventually. But right now, Bruce is going to talk to us about the school board. And Mother's Day. Mother's Day. I mean, okay. I mean, that's why I'm here. I mean, that's why Don, Don called okay. me up. And say, Bruce, she can't say Mother's Day today. We have to say Happy Mother's Day to you. <laughs> okay. And Don's going to be on here very shortly. He's going to say Happy Mother's Day to you. Okay. I mean, your husband's saying Happy mm -hmm. Mother's Day. And he's got another thing. He's got another Father's Day coming up because mm -hmm. he just graduated. Yes. You know, he's now a professor. Professor. <laughs> he has his tenure in. And so he's going to share that with you guys. But anyway, but it is Mother's Day. And, and I wanted to make sure that uh, I tell my wife, Norma, Happy Mother's yeah. Day. And. Happy Mother's Day to all the viewers here at Oregon Voters Digest. We've been traditionally doing this every year. We talk to them about Mother's Day and Happy Mother's Day to you, Teresa. Thank you. Okay, we, we appreciate your efforts and appreciate your being here, but we also appreciate your your definition and background on being a mother because I know hard work. It is. Especially <laughs> one of those one of those young men that I know, uh, Don. What, what's his name? <laughs> Don Dupay. <laughs> But he's a good, he's a good guy. <laughs> yeah. we, we run together, so he has to say the same things for me, too. But, <laughs> but anyway, but I think it's very important that we, we do share that, in fact, because it's, we are living in some very difficult times right now, and, and uh, we tend not to just take the time to, to say that because we got the, we got the national campaign, we got the national, we got the presidential election that's over with now, and it looks like we're still in the election. <laughs> we'll probably still be here for the next four years, mm -hmm. maybe eight years, if you will. And so, but that's, that's over there in that world. I'm here more interested in the Portland metropolitan area and like what you're getting ready to do here after I leave aspect of it. But the other thing, I mean, we are right in the midst of a of a of uh, an election, a special election for Portland School District uh, on the, for the board, if you will. And as you know, it's the largest school district in the state of Oregon. And uh, there's still some major problems there. The largest minority population comes out of Portland metropolitan area. And there's a major failure rate in, in, in that school. So it's very important that we get the right folks. And uh, we spent a lot of time uh, with, through Steve Buell. Steve Buell has been on the show a number of times. In fact, he's the only one that's been accessible to basically giving the, the public an update on an ongoing basis. Once a month, he was on there, on here, and, and uh, Paul Anthony was another guy that was doing it also too. But uh, he's leaving the school board, and uh, that's going to be a, quite a loss. And so naturally, uh, we challenged. I, I talked to him about this issue, and he said, "Bruce, I, I think I've got the right replacement." And as to through Rita Moore, I've, I've had the opportunity to chat with her about this piece aspect of it. I mean, very open, got a lot of background, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So she's going to be great mother. Happy Mother's Day, Rita. <laughs> and I would suggest very strongly that um, uh, you vote for Rita Moore, okay, on that particular ticket. The other one is um, Julia Brim Edwards. Julia is, uh, she's been on the board before. She's, she was an employee of, uh, I think she still is, of Nike. She's, the, she's a big time exec up in that area. And Nike has been a you know major community supporter for the schools, you know, and, uh, and so by behind, she's got that skill and that background and from the corporate community aspect of it, which we need, being that the the, the state budget's going to be having some tough times, and so consequently we want to be looking for that support. That's another one I, we 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 surely recommend that you vote for. Her. And the other one is a uh, Virginia Lafort. She's new to the deal, but she's very much she has been very much involved with the the school system aspect of it. And um, very tough woman. In fact, it was said by the person that's running against uh, that's going to that's running against uh, Rita Moore. Yeah, I, I want to make sure I pronounce her name right. But Amelia, but Jamelia. Anyway, but the bottom line is that she's an African American woman, neat lady aspect of it, but really don't have the skill that Rita aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But she made a point about the fact that that uh, <clears throat> that Steve Buell was a disruptor. And uh, if anything, we need more disruptors, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we got three of them right here. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, so it's a very important piece. We're gonna be in some tough times, 
And so we, we encourage you to do that. And I might want to do another point out for, I spoke to uh, Cynthia, ha Cynthia Harris, who is, uh, she came to Portland, Oregon as an administrator in the, at the Portland Public School. And she, eventually she went to uh, Jefferson High School. She was yeah. principal over there. Over she's there. wonderful. And I watched that been, show. And she's been on the show many times yeah. over. They were doing great things at Portland, yeah. with, with, with that area. But unfortunately, they, they, they let her go. Politics. Right. Politics. Right. But she's still here. Good. And she's fighting Good. hard, et cetera, et cetera. And so I spoke to her about that. And I think this going to be, these going to be her selections too. Mm -hmm. She selected these three people too. Mm -hmm. So we went back and forth and back and forth about <coughs> these folks and whatever. And like I said, I got to give the, uh, the thank you, Steve Buell, for, for the time that you've been on the school board and, and the efforts that you've made in the community and, and trying, if you will, to upgrade the education for all kids. But again, specifically, you, you did a major focus for African-American kids. And yeah. I thought that was a very neat piece. I watched so, I watched the last you like time you had him on. Yes, yeah. good people. He's there. a great guy. Yes. So with that, and like I said, this is, this is that's, that's basically the point I'd like to make at this point in time. Thank you for allowing us to do this. And uh, this is Mother's Day. Again, <laughs> happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Very much. I'm going to excuse myself at this point in time. I guess we're going to take a short break, right? Yes. Let's take a short break, and then we'll come back, and it's yours. Okay. We're going to okay. take a break, and we'll be right back. Thank you, Bruce. Sure. Thank you. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. You're back watching another episode of Oregon Voters Digest. We initially had um, arranged to have Phil Stanford on, but he wasn't able to make it, so we're going to go ahead and reschedule with Phil. Um, I have J.D. Chandler here today and my husband, Don Dupay, and we're going to talk about writing, and we're going to talk about J.D.'s books, and we're going to talk about Rose City Vice by Phil Stanford. Um, I have some questions that I, <laughs> that I wrote. Um, and I'm just going to kind of wing it here, J.D. <laughs> um, you've read the book um, more than once. I've I have, read it yes. fully one time, and I, I'm going to need to read it two or three more times before I really can internalize all of the information in the book. But um, uh, Phil Stanford talks about the payoff, um, the payoffs that, were, um, that occurred pretty regularly in the 60s and the 70s at PPB. And um, what do you think um, about that? Do you think that they've that they've stopped, that they, that they continue to this day? Well, I don't know what's going on now with any of this stuff. But um, in the book, Phil makes the connection between the 1950s vice scandal mm -hmm. and the 1970s narcotic scandal and kind of shows that things really hadn't changed. Mm -hmm. um, because the whole outcome of the 1957 vice scandal was, okay, we got rid of the bad guys, we have cleaned everything up, everything's fine in Portland now. Um, but right. nobody went to jail. Right. Nobody was, you know, only one guy was charged with anything. Uh, mm -hmm. Jim Elkins, the main witness, is the one who ended up seeing legal consequences, and he lost a lot of his power after that. Mm -hmm. But he was not the one who was calling the shots or, you know, who was behind any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. The guys who were doing that were sour. You know, Terry Shrunk was mayor for the next 20 years. Right. So, you know, things didn't really change, and, and uh, Phil shows really well what the effects of that were on the police bureau in the 70s. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you're right, nothing did change, because when they came back from Washington, D.C., um, Jim Purcell, Jr., the chief of police, and, and Terry Shrunk, the mayor, when they came back, uh, nothing really changed. He was still the mayor, although uh, Jim Purcell, Jr. lost his job as chief of police, uh, he was placed in a position of power at North Precinct. So 
so what changed? Nothing. Yeah. The mayor was still the mayor. The chief of police was still running his prostitution business at Cropley uh, behind uh, the desk at North Precinct with his badge. And uh, the vice squad was still doing what they always did. So the three people who ran the city, Purcell, Shrunk, and um, what's that man's name at workplace? Crisp. Crisp. <laughs> Carl Crisp. Carl Crisp. Between those three guys, they ran the city. And when the new guys come in, like me, the new breed, they shuffled us off to stupid shit. Mm -hmm. But they still live Fools on the city. Errands. So what happened? Not much new. So Not much new. I want to ask no. you both this question. In the book, in, in Rose City Vice, Stanford suggests that Earl's son was murdered. And it's, it sounds pretty compelling, and I'm curious about that, because to me that was a really important part of the book. Earl's son was a, was a, was a sheriff detective, and he had announced that, that um, he was going to disclose some information about two Portland police officers guilty of murder. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden he winds up committing suicide, which... Um, Des Connell expressed his belief that it wasn't suicide to, I think, a family member of Earl's son. Yes. What are your thoughts, both of you, about Earl's son and his alleged uh, suicide? <clears throat> well, Earl's son was a Multnomah County Sheriff's Officer from the 50s up until sometime in the 70s. And then he retired and he went to work for Des Connell as a private investigator. Okay. Um, and so in 1979, December 1979, there was the raid on the Outsiders Motorcycle Club mm -hmm. up in St. John's. Right. And Dave Crowther, a uh, rookie on the right. narcotics division, was shot to death. Mm -hmm. um, so Des Connell was the defense attorney for uh, Robert Pigpen Christopher, right. who did the shooting. And so Earl's son was trying to make a case for his innocence, uh, that it was self-defense. Right. And so it came to a point where the only way he could really do that was to prove that the cops who ran that raid, um, Scott Deppie and Neil Gerhardt, were corrupt. Right. And so he was looking for evidence of that. And there was a lot of evidence of right. that. Right, a lot of evidence. And so the story that Phil tells is that around Christmas of 1980, uh, Earl's son was in his office downtown with uh, uh, Pigpen and some of the other members of the Outsiders, and he told and he told Pigpen he said, "Don't worry, you're going to jail." He says, "I've got the I've got the evidence, and I can I can prove that the police have are are uh, these police officers are guilty of two murders." Right. And shortly after the New Year, he was found at his home, shot to death. With, right. his, with his service revolver. And this was a man who had bragged about having never, he didn't like guns. He never used it. He had never used his service revolver. So, so I want to ask you, Don, this question, which most people don't know about. This is inside information that you shared with Phil Stanford, but he didn't use in the book um, because it's hearsay or whatever. But you know of certain things that Scott Deppie did to a former wife of yours and no. a former older son of yours. So, do you want to talk about that? Well, the, these <clears throat> this vice gang that was doing all of these robberies uh, were also involved in several ongoing robberies of a former wife of mine who was uh, a heroin, or not a heroin dealer, but a cocaine and marijuana dealer. And uh, and this involved your older son. This involved one my my older adopted son. And they would go over to their house and rob them. Uh, one time they robbed them of a 50-pound bale of marijuana, and uh, they took it. Uh, apparently they didn't care for the quality, and so they brought it back and traded it for something else. And uh, this was during about this, a five. This was, this was during about a five-year period yeah. when you didn't have any contact with no either contact. your ex-wife or your um, adoptive no, we were, son. we were divorced. So. Right. But this kept going on. My my thing about it is that Earl's son knew all of this, and he was murdered in 1981. One. One. Yeah. And Zebedee Manning was murdered in 1975. 75. Both ruled so, suicide. Right. Both ruled suicide. And I have always thought that Earl's son had figured out which one of the guys had Zebedee Manning, and that was one of the two or three murders I that think, he knew about. I think mm -hmm. that's true. So, and that's we, can't actually, we can't actually discuss who we think did that, but, but we can say, you can share yeah. with the listening audience what you remember 
your ex-wife telling you um, about these two people well, they, coming you know, to they, their home? They would come to the house and... and uh, and didn't it get so, of, it became so frequent yeah. that at one point she made a Thanksgiving dinner? Yeah, she finally, my ex I finally got to the point where she just invited them for Thanksgiving dinner. And right. they, they got to be kind of family. <laughs> you know, they'd come for their dope for, for they go to work and have dinner and have a drink and whatever. And go out to one, go to work. And at one point, so, at one point during one of the initial robberies, isn't it true that Scott Deppy took a gun and held it to your adoptive son's yes, head absolutely. and threatened to kill him. Threatened to kill him, yeah. Okay. So that's that's the nature of the animal that was that was being protected by the upper yeah. the upper people at that time who uh, Phil Stanford names in and his book to a certain The only point. reason yeah. that they're being protected is because this yeah. is this is part of a corrupt system that's been right. going on for yeah. generations. Yeah. Right. And if if Obviously, we have two cops that are completely out of control. Right. Yeah. But if we do anything about it, yeah. it's going to expose all this stuff that everybody That's, else is involved in. Exactly. Trying to keep a lid on a, yeah. on a just an impossible situation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so this is just something I was thinking about, talking about. Um, you know, I've mentioned it a couple of times to some people, and people have also mentioned to me, um, Phil Stanford has been accused of being a conspiracy theorist by more than a few people. And um, can you give me that? And one of the things, one of the really beneficial things about Don's book, Behind the Badge in River City, a Portland Police Memoir, which was first published in 2015. This is the second edition, and it was published um, in uh, 2016, is that um, with Don's book, Behind the Badge in River City, it really it really corroborates all of this that Phil Stanford ever said in Portland Confidential. And now Phil Stanford has, I mean, obviously he's always had credibility, but there were a lot of people that, that would say he's a conspiracy theorist. It wasn't really that bad. These things didn't really happen. And with Don's book, Don's book corroborates everything he ever said in Portland Confidential and now in Rose City Vice. It's funny that you say that because I've actually heard from the other side, that maybe he's he's part of the conspiracy because he only tells a little bit of the truth. Mm -hmm. What Phil does is he tells you what he can prove. Right, right. He's he's an old old fashioned journalist. That right. means he has journalistic ethics. Exactly. Which means he's only going to tell you what he believes to be the truth right. because he's checked it. Right, and yeah. that's important. He's an investigative journalist. Yes. yes. And so he only tells a little bit of the story, and there's a lot more. Mm -hmm. So. That's the conspiracy that I've heard him accused of being involved in, mm -hmm. is keeping the cover on. But mm -hmm. he's, he's taking the cover off, but a lot of this stuff is real to prove, especially right. after so much time. Right. And, uh, you know, and I personally think things haven't really changed in Portland. 30, 40, 30 or 40 years from now, the stories about what are happening now are going to come out, and we're going to know the truth about our city government. Uh, because it takes that long for this stuff to come out. I agree with that to a degree, but I also think that PPB is not as corrupt as it was in 1975 or 1980. I, have, I, I don't know. I, I really don't think it is because... I don't have any reason to believe it's not. <laughs> okay. It's just like, I mean, when you consider, when you consider this recent thing that happened with um, Marshman and he was turned in by three people, I mean, there's, I think there's such a, an atmosphere of paranoia well, there's and suspicion. A there's that, a different feeling among police officers yeah. these days than there were in those days. There is definitely not, I don't think there's as much of a sense of camaraderie um, as there was in the 70s or the 80s because... That could um, be true. Don would know a lot more yeah. about that. Yeah. I mean, you, you wrote in your book about, about one of the guys um, who was a patrolman. He worked at East Precinct and then you worked together as detectives, Phil Todd, a great cop. Um, all I've ever heard about him were good things and how he would come to the precinct um, drunk like three, four times a week, yeah. and the <coughs> other guys would fly him full of coffee and drive him around to get him to sober up. Because stuff him in a police car. Stuff him in a police car. <laughs> Before roll call. Before yeah. roll call. Yeah. That's because in the days of the Portland Police Athletic Association. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> because they were trying to help their friend out. That, that kind of thing probably wouldn't happen. I don't know. Probably not. Today, yeah. to, on the same level. But, um, but anyway... Um, the fascinating thing to me about this book is that I'm one of the few people that knows just about everybody yes. that they talk about it. Right. Yes. All yeah. of these thugs and thieves from uh, from Battle and Nelson, who I had an unfortunate encounter with and mm -hmm. was lately later murdered, is uh, covered in this story. Yeah, Battling Nelson, uh, Willie Nelson. You know, 
I worked for all these people. Uh, was it Larry? Masney. Larry Masney, you know, who is prominently uh, talked about in the book as a, as a heroin addict and a burglar. I can remember Larry Masney was such a problem to us when we were working in burglary. We knew where he lived. We were going to try and catch him in red-handed because chasing after this broken doors and broken windows, he was keeping <coughs> didn't help. Yeah. So. Did you want to talk about what happened to you with Willie Nelson? You were a patrolman, and it was probably about 1963 or 64, yeah. and you had an encounter with, what was his first name, his real name? Howard? Harold. Harold, Harold Penland, Penland, a.k.a. Yeah. Willie Nelson. Well, that was a long time ago, so I was working traffic. I was parked at 72nd in Woodstock, and I was writing a report. And this car just, Cadillac just flew by in front of me, right through the stop sign. Whoa. <laughs> so I pulled out behind him. I had an unmarked car, turned on my red light. Duke Street was the next traffic sign, stop sign, and that was the city limits. So once he got out of Duke, headed towards Flavel, he was uh, out of the city. I was able to get him pulled over about a half a mile uh, out into the city limits and get him stopped. Got him out of the car. He was drunk, very combative. Uh, I didn't know who he was. I told him he was under arrest. I tried to grab him and handcuff him. He jerked out of He was very strong. Yeah. Grabbed him like grabbing a pipe. And he was a professional boxer. It turned out he was a professional boxer. <laughs> yeah. And all of a sudden, I saw this flash of the blade as he comes as he tried to, to strike to stab me. And he took off running. I fired a shot at him or two. <laughs> And uh, the next day, the detectives found him and arrested him, and there was a bullet hole in his coat. The left side of his lapel, yeah. The right side of his coat. Right, right side, okay. Yeah. So he, he came about four inches from dying. Wow. And he died by gunshot wound. He in did. Day, you know? He did, and it's uh, years later. It's one of the long unsolved murders in Portland, the yeah. murder of Harold and Laura Penland in uh, yeah. I think 1980, 81. Yeah. Right. And it's really interesting because um, uh, Phil tells the story, and he names who are most likely to be the killers in here, mm -hmm. uh, which was Willie. He, there's a lot of suspects, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. Willie's heroin um, supplier mm -hmm. and his brother, who was a professional killer are probably the ones that did it right and uh the story that phil has told me he doesn't tell in here is that um i think uh, i can't remember the name but uh the heroin dealer was in hawaii on vacation mm -hmm. and willie burglarized his house while he was on vacation that was willie light to steal from people mm -hmm. right and he li and he had regular burglary scams for his whole career and uh but he didn't know that there was a security camera on right and so the heroin dealer came home and found his house burgled and then he found the the security video that showed it was willie who had done it right and that was the reason he was actually that makes sense <laughs> <laughs> so and it's kind of nice to know who finally killed willie battling and, and willie nelson what's interesting about about this and his this poor wife rose city vice Portland in the 70s, Dirty Cops and Dirty Robbers by Phil Stanford. Another really interesting aspect of that story is what happened to Laura Penland. And this is information that Phil got from some of his yeah. underworld sources. Um, she was told by the killers that she could shoot up heroin one last time and take as long as she needed or as much as she needed. And they had tried to prevent her from being there the day before by inviting her to dinner, but she had the flu. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of an interesting story. It's a sad story. It it's is. just a heartbreaking story it because is. what it tells me is the, she knew the killers. And they didn't and they, want to kill her. And they liked her. Right, and they liked and her. And it makes sense because their house that <clears throat> Willie lived in was a fortress. Right. Uh, he was paranoid. Right. Rightfully so, because he'd mm -hmm. been victimizing people for 20, 30 years. He'd been point. burglarizing uh, homes, and he'd also raping. been raping. Yes. He'd been raping regularly throughout the city. Yeah. So he had created a lot of enemies. Yeah. And he died shot to death. Do you know if he was shot in the head or the chest? I don't know. He was hanging upside down he was in a pair of gravity down. boots. I know that. That's just awful. <laughs> when was he killed? I think it was 81, yeah, mm -hmm. 81. 80, something yeah. like that. I don't remember. Yeah. And they're both on the cold case. Uh, they're both. Uh, so Penland it was about 1965 when I first ran across him. So he mm -hmm. lived another 20 years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was probably in, he was probably not much older than you. Mm -hmm. You both were probably in your early 20s. He victimized a lot of people in that time yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. I don't. Oh, 1983. He died in 1983. 1983 yeah. yeah. 
It was 65 or so when I ran across him, 65, 66. And the story of, of his wife's death is very, very mm-hmm. sad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. I mean, that, that is definitely really sad. It, it kind of shows in a bizarre way that sometimes killers and, and criminals can have a, a very interesting code of ethics, you know, because they could have just not let her shoot up. They could have, I mean, it, it, was, a, it was a kindness, yeah. you know. Sometimes we have kindness. <laughs> Even a so, professional killer might. <laughs> so I had, I had written out these questions for Phil, but um, did you want to talk about uh, Vince Capitan? Ah. Um, anything that you know? That do you made... know? Do you know about Vince Capitan? Not did you? Well. No, yeah, Capitan, the Ice Man. Capitan he was in jail. Was, he was in jail most of the time. <laughs> yeah. I was a detective. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Vince Capitan was a Portland character. It's a great picture of him in yeah. here in his shark skin suit. Yeah, with the skinny he was, tie. He was a <laughs> drapery hanger. The Oregonian called him an interior decorator. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But he wanted to be a gangster. Right. And he wanted to be a tough guy. And he had he was a petty criminal right. uh, from San Francisco who had gone to McNeil Island. And he had committed a federal crime by, I think, robbing a Wells Fargo courier in San mm-hmm. Francisco. So he ended up in McNeil Island. Mm-hmm. And while he was there, he met this another ex-boxer, uh, Carl Mendoza. Mm-hmm. Yeah. who was from Portland and who was kind of a semi-famous boxer from Portland. And I don't remember what he'd gone to jail for, but he was also at McNeil Island. He was the champion boxer at McNeil mm-hmm. Island. And so they both got out around the same time and went into business together. Um, they were smash-and-grab guys. Right. Uh, one would go into a business and uh, talk to the owner or the person mm-hmm. who was working there and kind of distract them while the other one would go back and take everything out of the cash mm-hmm. register. So really low-level criminals. Right. Tilt up. It's called a tilt up. The tilt up. Tilt up. Tilt up. Yes. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> the smash and grab guys go in with the. No oh, right. You're right. Pickup. Sorry. <laughs> it was a tilt up. Okay. I got my jargon correct. <laughs> but uh, um, he also he married uh, I think Joni Wright is her name mm-hmm. was his his wife's name and she was a madam ran prostitution, mm-hmm. and Michael Wright was her son and so Vincent's stepson. Right. And he was bringing him into the family business. So Mike, was... Michael was learning to be a pimp. Okay, right, prostitution. And um, so Carlos Mendoza became a problem. Uh, mm-hmm. It was because of an arrest. I think it might have been an arrest in McMinnville um, in 1968. And he was rolling over on Capitan. He was going to cooperate with the police and give evidence on Capitan mm-hmm. and send Capitan to jail. And he had also made the mistake of beating up one of Michael Wright's prostitutes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mendoza was a sadist who liked to beat prostitutes with a wire coat hanger. And there's another connection to that I we'll talk about he, in a second, yes, if you want, he, if you want right I now. I think he killed Olivia Brown a few weeks before he died, but I have no well, evidence. Well, and you said she was beaten with she a was coat hanger. She was beaten with coat hangers. That's a, that's a signature bit. I, mean, I think he's the killer. Yeah. Uh, and that's part of the reason that her, beca- except besides the fact that she was an expendable person, mm-hmm. and they probably didn't waste any resources on her. And Olivia Brown is mentioned in Rose City Vice. No. She's not? No, she's not. Okay. She's, that's my own bugaboo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's my own unsolved And, and I've, read it, I've read it page, page to page, and I, 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 you know, there's a lot to absorb, so I'm going to have to read it at least twice more. <laughs> but anyway, Vince Capitan wanted to... First of all, make sure that Carlos Mendoza didn't talk. Mm-hmm. And second, send a message to everybody that you can't cross him. Right. And so he shot him to death. Yeah. And um, Michael Wright ended up being part of the rap for that and ended up going to, uh, to jail. Or I don't remember what happened exactly to Michael, mm-hmm. but Vincent Capitan did end up in jail for mm-hmm. uh, murder uh, in 1968. And while he was in jail, he learned the crystal meth business. Right. And so when he got out in the 70s, he set up a crystal meth operation with a, a lab out at Boring and mm-hmm. um, had the Outsiders Motorcycle Club doing distribution for him. Mm-hmm. At the same time, he was driving the kitty train up at uh, Washington Park Zoo. <laughs> that is so comical. I, I read that and I was like, really? <laughs> Seriously? He had to have a job because he was on probation. <laughs> um, so it, it's a very, it's a wild story. Right. And it completely sets up the 1979 raid on the Outsiders Club because... Mm-hmm. Scott Deppie and Neil Gerhardt from the Special Investigations Division of the Narcotics Squad uh, were targeting Capitan because he no longer had protection. Before mm-hmm. he went to jail, he was protected and they could <coughs> really go after him. After he got out of jail, he was kind of a man. Mm-hmm. He was running crystal meth operation. He had the Outsiders Motorcycle Club working with him, and they decided to get him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was this process that they, they raided his club out or his lab out in Boring, but it was all cleaned up. 
Uh, so they didn't have any evidence, so they planted some heroin on Capitan. This was their, st these guys, this was their standard operating procedure. If we don't find drugs, we've got them for you. Mm -hmm. um, so they planted heroin on him and violated his parole, and then they went after the outsiders. And that led to the shooting of Dave Crowther, mm -hmm. which led to the murder trial of Pigpen Christian, uh, which led to the investigation of, of Deppy and Gerhard and their crimes. And then also led to, um, to Earl Sun's And Earl Sun's death, death. yes. However that happened. And so it's this big tangled sure. web uh, sure. that that Phil does a great job of telling in a yeah. very slim, easily easily read book. Yes. And Vincent Capitan is one of the big characters. Lots of characters. Yeah. Phil, Phil's yeah. real talent is telling the stories of people. And uh, he does a great job. He in has that. a wonderful style of writing. It's very um, witty and uh, very Mike Hammer-like, you know? <laughs> but it's fun, he's fun to read. I'm more intelligent than Mike Hammer. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but wh what I find interesting about that um, Men uh, the killing... Um, Mendoza? Yeah, um, the, the prostitute that was Olivia, beaten. Uh, uh, Olivia Brown. Right, because to, and it was a, it was a favorite method of... Men of M Mendoza was right. known for beating women with, with beating, coat hanger prostitutes and women's with and I'm presuming it's a metal and a wood coat hanger right I I always assume metal I don't know I don't know probably the most damage a coat hanger could do would not be the plastic or the metal ones they have but the metal and the wood ones yeah and, and I can imagine that being beaten in the face with a metal and wood coat hanger would disfigure a prostitute I, I don't know that that's what he was doing I think it was just about pain he liked to inflict pain wow yeah, because for them to use that as another reason to want to kill him, I mean, he must have really messed that he, girl he up. He did. He hurt her. That's terrible. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But and he was a sadist. He liked to hurt women. Yeah, yeah. So you know, he, nice guy. yeah, as a murder victim, good choice. But you know, don't kill people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, I was really curious about what happened. This this question was meant for Phil. I'm really curious about Ginger Cardwell, and she's in the book. Um, and, and in the book, Phil suggests that she was, um, may she's have been. She's on the cover there. Yeah. She's, um, she was know, a, let me see. she was like a pornographer or. I, I don't even remember she the was, story. She was, she, sexy saunas, right? Or was oh, that? <laughs> is that what, yeah. <laughs> I so, think so. So they were, uh, they were laundering the money from George Desbrose's heroin yeah. operation through the sexy yeah. saunas. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> she was a, a beautiful woman. There's a photograph of her right there. Um, she was blonde. And, uh, and Phil Stanford suggests in the book that, um, that she disappeared and her, her boy may have murdered her. But he also says he heard that she married a rich Californian. Yeah. Personally... Terry, Terry Mydell was her boyfriend, right. and they were involved in that. I, I think it was the sexy saunas. The sexy saunas, yeah. Well, one of those massage parlor yeah. deals they were involved with. It makes you wonder. I mean, if there, if you can't find anything on her, if there's no record of her, I'm presuming, number one, she probably was murdered and disappeared. Well, and Terry Mydell's later history kind of lends credence to that. And what, what was that? Uh, I don't remember the details, but he ended up becoming very hardcore outlaw. Hmm. Um, after her disappearance. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of con that kind of yeah. mm -hmm. confirms. But that kind another of thing. thing that that uh, uh, Phil goes into besides the uh, uh, massage parlors, the um, Portland massage parlors of the seventies, he gets into the pornography shops. Right. Uh, and I did not even <clears throat> realize this that the film loop projector. Oh right. Was invented here in Portland. It was invented here in by Portland. By Tom Shaw, <laughs> right. one of our crazy filmmakers. Right. And he uh, patented that, and then they opened the first photography loop shop right. on uh, Southeast Burnside and 7th. Uh -huh. I remember was that shop. Was it Cindy's? No, Cindy's is on the other okay, side of the river. Right. And that was Michael Wright's business later. Oh, oh, I know which one you mean. But it was right on the corner of, of 7th and Burnside. Right. And my great uncle was the electrician who wired it. And I didn't oh didn't put this together until many years <laughs> later. But I remember him, Cl my Uncle Cliff so telling his name me was, about his that. his name was Tom Shaw. Tom Shaw was the... he invented the loop. He was the inventor of the loop projector. And his, Interesting. his partner at one point ended up going to jail for drugs. Uh -huh. And then later partnering with Michael Wright in uh, Cindy's uh, uh -huh. shop. Uh, but Tom Shaw kind of inherited all of these pornography shops. He was an engineer right. and an inventor and a would-be filmmaker. Uh -huh. And suddenly he had a huge amount of money from these pornography shops, and so he started making films. Right. And uh, he made, um, I forgot what it's called, The Courier of Death. I the think Courier is, of Death. It's considered and the worst film ever made by some people. 
the French, the French, some Scot French, Scottish, the Sc right, the Scot, <laughs> the Scot, some Scottish filmmakers have deemed the Courier of Death the worst film ever made, even above Plan Nine from Outer yeah. Space, which and, I and find Tom Shaw, amazing. <laughs> Tom Shaw is kind of our own Ed Wood, as he's kind yeah. of the Portland version of Ed Wood, right. because uh, in the seventies he opened a little movie studio on Southeast Division mm -hmm. uh, to make his crazy films, right, and. They describe him as uh, <laughs> kind of a short guy who mm -hmm. always drank white Russians. And by <laughs> 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, he was out. He would never do, um, never could do two takes. Always had to be one take, no matter right, how bad right. it was. <laughs> this is part of what gave his films their awfulness. Uh, but he also provided opportunities for a lot of the kids in the neighborhood, sure. right. uh, young teenagers that wanted to make movies. And right. one of them was Gus Van Sant. Oh my gosh, that's it's how, right. It's how Van Sant got his start, was uh, working with Tom Shaw. Interesting. I do remember that. I do remember that. It's a great story. I'm going to have to write it up for my weird Portland blog one of these days. Yeah. Um, so I was going to ask Phil <laughs> about um, if he had any special information on Neil Goldschmidt, oh. what he knows about Neil Goldschmidt. He definitely has some information on uh, Goldschmidt in here. Is it all in here or is, uh, I think, is some of it in here? I think he tells pretty much what he knows. Okay. But he tells what he knows. Do mm -hmm. you want to... Well, you know, Neil Goldschmidt was before my time, so no, I don't know much about him other than just the rumors. So. Yeah. Well... It was. Um, the one after who knows your time. about him is Ron Buell. <laughs> was he the driver? No, Ron. No, Buell, no, no, no. Ron no. Buell was his. Uh, oh, the. Uh, Ron Buell was his. Uh, campaign, campaign manager. manager. Ah, okay. Yeah. But we, okay. But it, we need to talk about that. What it looks like is that <coughs> the vice squad. Yeah, we need to talk about that. Followed Neil Goldschmidt one night without knowing who it was. And they found out that he was having an affair with a 13-year-old girl in his neighborhood. And the one cop called her his little honey. Yes, there was a lot of that. And then they actually yeah. had evidence on him and possibly mailed him doing, during union negotiations. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's like, Wait they basically, basically the police union yeah. said, we know what the mayor's doing. Right. We know that the majority of the city council are using cocaine on a regular basis. Right. We don't care about anything but the contract that we're negotiating. Right. I do remember that from reading the book. We will look the other way. Exactly. Just give us a good deal. If you give us a deal. deal. <laughs> Has the police department changed? I, I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> One of the interesting people in here is uh, the guy that uses the nickname the senator. The senator. The senator. The senator. And... Uh, this picture is in there, and what's of interesting thing to me this is... This is, we need to mention him, because the audience might not know who you're talking about. I'm this not sure. is um, the snitch. What was his name? The arsonist? Roland. Jack Roland. Jack Roland. Oh, Jack Roland. I right. didn't know he was the senator. So Don <laughs> yeah, well, bumped into him a few years ago, and he goes by the senator. This is Jack Roland. Yeah. He was kind of a compassionate guy. Kind of interesting thing about him is... He was a professional arsonist, and uh, I had occasion to visit him and to, uh, get to know him a little bit while uh, we were both in Multnomah County Jail. <laughs> uh, I was there on a humbug, and I got to know Roland a little bit, and he talked to me about some of the things that he was involved with, and he admitted to be, and bragged about, being a professional arsonist. And so uh, we should we should explain why you were there. You were falsely no. accused of firing a weapon in the city limits, and the case was thrown out of court by Judge Litzenberger for lack of evidence. Yeah, it was a humbug. Charge. It was a humbug. Some of the cops in the Portland Police Department were still trying to catch me. <laughs> yeah, we looked at the discovery, and um, one anyway. of the detectives had written. Apparently, Dupe was a detective, which I consider a hostile kind of note. But anyway, what were you saying? Anyway, uh, <laughs> he was involved in a lot of arsons around town. And he told me that the best way that he found to burn down a house was to put a, a pound of bacon in an iron skillet, <laughs> put it on the stove, turn it on high, and leave. <laughs> he says it worked for him a couple of times. Wow. And he was an arsonist that was involved in a lot of planning. And so he would go into business, so to speak, with the business owner that wanted his business burned down. And they would arrange to have the correct amount of insurance, insurance that covered the employees for loss of income during the time that the business would be down, 
lost the business insurance, and so everybody was taken care of. So and he was he, an arson he, consultant. He's an arson consultant. <laughs> and then after, all, after it was all taken care of, he'd wait a while, and then a fire would start. Mm -hmm. And he bragged about he burned down a large uh, uh, machine shop, and he also told me he burned down Sailor's old country kitchen. <laughs> he was also involved in burning cars, which is one of the stories burning, burning in here cars, yeah. <laughs> for the insurance. One of the one of the most um, entertaining stories. So it I, wasn't a hot steak. It <laughs> wasn't a hot steak. It wasn't a hot steak. It was a, it was pound, a pound of a bacon in the fry. It wasn't a pound of bacon. No. <laughs> one of the most enjoyable stories from this book that I, I really enjoyed, and I, I I definitely know why it's the last story, ah. is the story about Buddy Moore. I met Buddy Moore once about. And he was a used car ago. dealer, right? He was a used car yeah. dealer. I met him one time three years ago, and he seemed perfectly fine. We found out recently he's in a home for Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. But um, the story about Buddy Moore in the end, during the 1975 um, shortage of antifreeze that resulted in this this criminal conspiracy happening in Portland, and how did you describe it? A, a Damon Runyon. It's a right. Runyon-esque story. Um, <laughs> right. Damon Runyon was a newspaper, an old-fashioned newspaper man from mm -hmm. New York City who uh, wrote short stories about the criminals who inhabited Broadway <laughs> in those days. Uh, Guys and Dolls, the famous mm -hmm. musical, comes from right. his stories. Mm -hmm. And I think that Phil does an excellent mm -hmm. job of writing a Runyon-esque story about not quite bad guys. Because mm -hmm. Buddy Moore comes out as kind of the hero of he the does. story. And uh, it's called Dino's Christmas, and Dino loses all of his money, $5,000 in a antifreeze scam, and if he, do, if he can't get it back, his kids are not going to have Christmas. Right, and this is because of some crooks that came either from New York or Chicago. These are out-of-state crooks yeah. that came to Portland, thought that we were going to be easy, and then it, it, it backfired. And Buddy tracks him down and gets Dino his money back and finds love at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful story, and I hope it becomes the classic Portland Christmas story. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's a wonderful story, and I remember reading it and just thinking, you know, it's only about three pages long, but there's so many details and dates and facts packed into it that it could easily become a, a, a screenplay. It could become a film. You know, it, it really could. I it's mean, it's a beautiful it's, story. It's a wonderful story. So, yeah. Um, I also knew Buddy Moore. Uh, <laughs> I bought a Cadillac from him when he had a car lot on 80, uh, about 84th or 86th. Like you've got a buddy in the car business. I had a buddy in the car yeah. business. And what was his What was his logo? I have a buddy in the car business. Right, right. So, so <laughs> Call Buddy Moore. I bought, bought you've a got car a buddy from him and got to know him that way. And uh, then when we moved our uh, dispensary over to 112th and Sandy, he had uh, he took the space addition to uh, adjacent, adjacent to us. And he had another car lot there. And that's where I met him and about three years ago. Uh, and my son uh, bought a, uh, a Lincoln from him and uh, made two payments with cocaine. So. <laughs> oh, but he was flexible. He was, a, he was a flexible. <laughs> he was flexible, yes. Well, that was, you found that out later, honey. You weren't aware of that, remember? <laughs> we discussed that. <laughs> it's a true story. I know, I know. It's a true story. Yeah. Everything you hear here is true. Well, generally. <laughs> Generally, and for the most part, um, so you've got some of your books here. JD, I do, yeah, and including the book that we co-authored. Yes, <clears throat> and uh, part of part of my work in writing these books has been was to corroborate some of the stuff in Portland Confidential. Yeah, sure. uh, Portland on the Take <laughs> right. uh, goes from uh, the 1934 dock strike. Uh, up to 1950 in the Joanne Dewey murder, mm -hmm. and it kind of sets the scene for the vice scandal that came a few years later, because yeah. uh, it talks about how that built and where, mm -hmm. what was taken over and who did the taking over mm -hmm. and how it all arranged. And then the book that we wrote goes back a couple of decades past that and sets up Murder Portland and on the Take. and Prohibition Portland. And it shows some of the, and, the, and this is not the original corruption, because I could probably write two more volumes going back another hundred years. Sure. Uh, showing very similar stories, <coughs> but this shows how prohibition allowed mm -hmm. the the corruption to really get organized. Yeah, mm -hmm. and when we were doing the research for that, um, you did the majority of the research, but I did <coughs> a little bit in the um, Portland Archives and Records <laughs> Center, and I found two letters. That was a really exciting that moment. That was a very exciting moment. I found two letters from um, Frank Irvin um, to the chief of police, Leon Jenkins, and they had been sanitized from both Jenkins' file and from um, uh, Frank Irvin's file, but they forgot 
that the, the, the secretarial pool would write, would, would include copies to who it was about, who it was from, and yeah. who it was going to. And so there were these two copies that were in John Cordes's file. Thank God and for I found bureaucracy. Those. Yes. Because they, they yeah. are, they're the smoking gun. They, right. They show that Chief Jenkins knew about the violations of prohibition that were going and on. And I bureau. remember there were, there were two, I think mm -hmm. they were both written in um, April 17th. Um, and I think it was 1930, 29 or 30. I don't remember. But they were basically Frank Irvin was was accusing Anna Schrader of of um, certain things, and basically he corroborated that there was indeed bootlegging going on out of the out of the he police headquarters, you know, in downtown Portland. And I remember oh, when no. I when I was reading them, I, I got that ex you know feeling. I, I got really excited. And I thought these are important. I just know JD is going to want to see these. Yeah. <laughs> That was exciting. That, that was exciting. exciting. And it, it, it happened from me just being really tenacious and just going through um, the files of anyone mentioned in the in the newspaper articles from the Oregonian. I just Well, and following that Anna Schrader thread, I knew that was yeah. a valuable thread because she is yeah. such an interesting character she and is. such an important character. Uh, and nobody remembers her. I know. And I, I think it's really good that we've dug out what we have about her. Yes. And that, that people are starting to remember a little bit about Anna Schrader. And, and I think it's important to keep her memory alive and to and to continue to do research on her because I just know there's more out there. And about she's surprising. Her. She, you know, she's a beauty queen. She's a <clears throat> uh, famous swimmer. She's a private detective who worked for the police bureau. Yeah. Um, she was um, trained yeah. by, as a police officer. Yeah. Um, she wasn't a very good shot, which is probably a good thing because she didn't hit <laughs> right. uh, William uh, Bruning. <laughs> William Bruning when she fired her shots at him. Yeah. Um, but uh, and then she really turned on the police bureau when when she felt like she'd been left behind. Hell him. hath no fury like a woman scorned. Yes. yes. And she she really let people know what was going on, and then yeah. she was so demonized and turned into a crazy person by the whole process. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a very sad story, and then I think I, I truly believe that she's the victim of the 1946 torso murder. I do too. Never identified. I do too. I remember. I mean, I've I've looked at the photographs of the skull. You know, the yeah. description of the skull, the hair. I mean, there's so many similarities, and I actually did contact the medical examiner, Karen Gunson, and some other people that she works with that do forensic photography and forensic computer facial reconstruction. And unfortunately, um, I really pushed it. Um, unfortunately, none of the photographs that we currently have would um, be anything they could use to do that. Right. And I, I emailed back and forth and begged and pleaded. And um, the woman that I was um, con that I was communicating with told me there's just not enough. But I know what I was able to discern naked eye. And I think that there's some there's validity to that. There's definitely some When you look at the skull and the eyebrows and the eyes and the cheekbones and the hairstyle, ringlets, when you look at the photograph of Anna Schrader with her hair done, the ringlets from the Oregonian article, and when you look at the skull and when you look at the notes from the autopsy, um, there's just too many, too many parallels in terms of identification. So I also definitely believe yeah. that, that, that the torso remains our Anna Schrader. Yeah were Anna Schrader. <laughs> but you also have a book here. It's another one of your books, Murder and Mayhem in Portland, Oregon. Murder and Mayhem in Portland, Oregon is my history of the city in murders. Mm -hmm. It goes from uh, 1850 up to about 1945. Yeah. And I picked out uh, murders from different periods of that time to illustrate different points about the city. Right. Um, so I, I tell a lot of murder stories. I talk about the Dark Strangler mm -hmm. in the 1920s and... Um, the Hill family in 1911, one of our, one of our big uh, unsolved murders of the century, really. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a whole family that was killed with an axe down in a, That's a right. suburb. And, uh, never, in Portland? Never solved. Yeah, it was just outside of Portland, down near Selwood. Oh, wow. Yeah, it wasn't actually part of I, Portland at the time. I do remember reading through that briefly. I need to look at and that again. And I, I identified a suspect in that, too. Well, mm -hmm. One of the biggest unsolved cases. This is, it's pretty clear uh, that this guy might have been involved. You know, that's the interesting thing about old murder cases. It, you read about some of these old murder cases, and these guys, many of these police officers in the, 18, the late 1800s, the early 1920s, the teens, had less than an eighth grade education. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 you really see the difference between police officers and investigators 
um, from that period and then those who came on in the 30s, 40s, 50s, especially the 60s and the 70s, it became more of a science then. And back then, these guys were, were struggling with basic literacy. Yeah. And you read about some of these cases and you're like, gosh, it seems so clear. That particular murder was not a you Portland know. case. That was Clowney Sheriff and it was mm -hmm. uh, Sheriff Mass who ended up becoming the longest serving mm -hmm. uh, Clackamas County Sheriff. Yeah. Uh, but this was his very first term. He had just been elected to office, and he had no police experience. Yeah. And he was not able to catch this killer. <laughs> Although there's some amazing things. This is some of the first use of, of forensics in a murder investigation mm -hmm. was on this Hill family case. Really? And it was two doctors from uh, Portland who invented they invented a, um, a spray-on chemical that could pick up traces of blood. Oh, it was wow. one of the, It was the first... Uh, Mm. That's use of fascinating. that, and it's in 1911. They wow. also, also there was a psychic involved. Oh my gosh! Uh, it's a, it's a crazy story, and it's a very interesting one. Uh -huh. I also, I tell the story of Bunko Kelly's murder. Mm -hmm. um, Bunko Kelly, the famous crimp. Uh, everyone talks about the Shanghaiing. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually went to jail in 1894 for a murder that he, mm -hmm. he committed. Mm -hmm. He always said he was framed, and he really kind of was framed, but he also probably really committed that murder. <laughs> <laughs> so. And then you also have this book, which you've said is your most popular book. It's called History of Portland, Oregon. And this is um, a little thicker than those two books, but is. this is this is your um, most popular, it best is. seller. It is. And this is my, this is maybe the book I'm most proud of, uh -huh. uh, Hidden History of Portland. Is this the first one? No, it's the second the one. The second one, okay. Uh, this one is not a murder-related book. Mm -hmm. uh, what I wanted to do was tell the untold history of Portland. Mm -hmm. So I talk about the Native American history and the okay. women's history and the right. gay history right. and the uh, African American history and Asian American history. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just go into some real detail and it's some things that we've forgotten. It's right. not anything that's unknown. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just stuff that we have forgotten over the years. Mm -hmm. And um, they're using it out at Madison High School to teach a local that's history right. class. I hope other high schools will pick it up too. Yeah. Uh, in fact, tomorrow, if it's not raining too much, I'm taking the Madison High School kids on a field trip out to Loan for a Cemetery. Oh, that's right. You do this on a regular basis. It, that's wonderful. It'll be our second annual yeah. one. And last year, they put a stone on the unmarked grave of Portland's first, first black firefighter. That's right, and that made them very, very proud of those kids. And that was something that you cre that you started. I helped. I showed them. Yeah. I showed them what needed to be done. And then they they mm -hmm. created a program where they did some fundraising and they put this. Um, they got in, in touch with the police with right. the fire department, which was actually they were replacing. One of the big problems that we have out at Lone Fir Cemetery is over the years, the, the stones get worn right. and they sink down into the ground. Right. And so a lot of the graves that are unmarked weren't originally unmarked. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and also we have 12 of the um, uh, people whose names are on the Dave Campbell Memorial, firefighters mm -hmm. who died in the line of duty. Mm -hmm. 12 of them are buried there in the, the firefighters cemetery at Lone Fir. And most of those gravestones were not even readable anymore. Wow. Uh, so they were putting 12 gravestones out there, and these kids got in touch with the committee that was doing that and told about um, this black firefighter who had no marker, and so they put 13 stones instead That's of 12. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. And and this is, I just want to promote Don's book a little bit, too. Um, this is Behind the Badge in River City of Portland Moore. We've spent the last year um, working with Barnes & Noble, so they're probably going to be selling it within the next month or two. But the second edition of Don's book has an additional story. It's called um, uh, Clarence's Sidewalk Demise, and it's uh -huh. a very cinematic story. It's on <laughs> page 187. This was the story that um, Don didn't want to write in the original the original book. Um, it took about took me about a year to convince him to sit down and write it, and I edited it. It's a it's a wonderful story. It's very graphic. It's very tragic. It's very sad, but it really shows how um, you know crime just doesn't pay, and it shows how how difficult it was for people in North and Northeast Portland to survive without without becoming in some way criminal um, just because there were no there were very few social opportunities. Um, One of the but, things I like the best about your book, Don, is how honest you are about stuff that's really hard to talk about. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you know, that, that's true because when we were, when, when Don was writing this and when we were editing it, um, we had a, a really wonderful editor who was, I think at the time he was just a little too young to be able to you know, contribute in the way that I had hoped. He contributed a, a lot. He was really wonderful. He 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 um, was able to shorten all of the chapters and knew when to do that. So he contributed a great deal. But one thing he kept saying was that we should take out certain sections where Don talks about mistakes he had made. 
He got angry once when he was chasing an eluder <coughs> for about 25 minutes. The guy crashed. Um, he ran over the car. He pulled him out, and he kicked him twice in the chest. <laughs> And, and this young man wanted to take that out. He wanted to take out several, about three or four sections where Don admitted to losing his temper, losing control. Um, and I said, no, that's not what memoir is about. Memoir is about the good and the bad. Well, I think it's really important to realize yeah. that you weren't doing anything that was unusual for Portland right, cops. Right, right. And compared to a lot of police officers at the time, he was right. considered a do-gooder. Um, and there was a there was a situation where he was in St. John's, and there was a woman who had been murdered by her husband with a shot. And he called, um, he called it in, and uh, no one came to provide backup. And that's when he really knew he was alone, um, because he was considered a do-gooder. He was considered one of the new breed. Um, but yeah, it's important when you're writing memoir. Um, I feel this very strongly. You have to be honest. You can't just try to make yourself look good. You can't try to make yourself out to be a hero. Of course, Don comes across like a hero in many respects in his book, but he's honest about the ways that he that he lost control, the, the things that happen in a long career that really test a police officer's patience and, and their sense of hope. Um, and he's honest about that, and that's what makes the book believable, and that's what makes hi him come across sympathetically, is because he's not trying to sugarcoat himself or make himself out to be a hero. He's honest about the things that, you know, that he did that were, that were difficult, you know, and, and the ways that he made mm -hmm. mistakes. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a wonderful book, and it is available on Amazon, and it will be selling very in Barnes & Noble. So... I don't remember making any mistakes. <laughs> the thing Losing about, control. The thing about kicking the, the guy in the chest. The thing, the thing about being honest is you have to be honest because it's an emotional job, right? And sometimes you react emotionally. Yeah. You know, you just that's just the way the job is. So. Well, we're concluding this episode of Oregon Voters Digest, mm -hmm. and hopefully Phil Stanford is okay. I hope to hear from him soon, mm -hmm. and um, we're going to try to get him on in the next week or two. Um, because we wanted to ask him a lot of these questions. But thank you so much, J.D., for coming here. And, I'm glad uh, to pinch hit. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll see you next see time here. on Oregon Voters <laughs> Digest. Thank you so much.